Okay, thank you. So um, what we are planning now, it's a bit, um, uh, we, uh, like a bit a summary of everything we have done in a way, but uh, toward the uh, um, modular code development, uh, which means if you really want to collaborate, we strongly believe that at some point you need to think about how you design your application. And your application needs to be as uh, modular as possible. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it facilitates development, co-development with your colleagues. So this is what we will, uh, will try to do. And um, you will collaborate with us. So in, in the sense, you will, uh, we expect you to give us some input on uh, how to improve a small code. And I will uh, show you what uh, what I mean by this. So we'll uh, we'll go through this this part, this lesson. Um, I guess you have it already somewhere in the HackMD or in uh, in the chat. And I will go to the next part here. And this is what we are trying to answer. So we'll uh, we'll use a HackMD first uh, to uh, uh, think about um, what modular code development means for you uh, and what uh, best practices you can recommend to a new person uh, on how to, uh, like a, you, you, are, you, are, you have new people coming in your team and they don't know very well programming. What would you suggest to structure the code? Uh, and it can be uh, in any uh, programming languages. It doesn't have to be uh, in Python. We did a lot of Python for simplicity, but uh, uh, put your uh, example for, from your favorite programming language. Um, and what do you know about programming uh, that you uh, wish somebody told you earlier? I think we already had the question as a icebreaker. Yes, so we can remove that one. Because yeah, we asked exactly. Earlier. Uh, so maybe we can add, I think this additional question is interesting. Do you design your code project on paper before coding? Um, and I, I would maybe elaborate on, do you, do you start coding directly without thinking on the design or do you think about the design and then you start, you start coding? And I don't think there is one approach is better than the other. Um, both can be good. So uh, maybe like five minutes to uh, have uh, some questions, some answer in the HackMD. I will share the HackMD so we can see if it's a bit shaky for me to, I will put it in the view mode. Yeah, and we'll wait for some inputs. So one practical question that came up, will there be more breakout rooms later? Because that's important for the exercise leads to know. Uh, I think we said we do everything here, no? Okay, good, all right. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. No, that's good. I think we'll ask uh, for contribution from uh, everyone here, uh, but more like suggestion, and uh, we'll try to implement here um, as a walk along session. Yeah, I think that's also better because then everybody will see these suggestions also. Yeah, because if uh, if you go in the breakout room, you will be disconnected from uh, uh, what we do here. Yes, so for the exercise leads, you can relax and watch and help and also ask questions and give suggestions. There won't be any more breakout rooms, but we will still thank you at the end of the session uh, for your work. Okay, so we can already see some uh, tips uh, on how to uh, make a modular code. Yeah, and if there is any um, comments where you fully agree with, yes, you can add a plus one or sum up or oh. 
for yes. I don't know what means O. I don't know why you use O uh, rather than and not Y. It probably has, a, for me, it has this we oui in French. <laughs> you mean for this, um, like voting? Yes. Is it like this, uh, or like a, a tick box? Or? Yeah, just that it, it looked good uh, as a, like a growing bar, but uh, I didn't think about the meaning of the character. So it could oh, be yeah, okay. X so or... So for me, it, it means like we, oui, and I was like, but why, what the fuck is putting the French? <laughs> <laughs> I think ideally I wanted like a tiny little box so that it would look like a... Uh, equalizer on, you know. Ah, on, yeah, OK. <laughs> yes, that's. Uh... So let's uh, one or oh, two more minutes. Voting matching, but she's practicing. But great points are coming in there. And again, wonderful yeah. to have the presentation written by participants here. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. We just copy past and we have a new lesson. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, I think already it's to have a separate long codes into modules or whatever it is called in the, your favorite programming language, which means split. Um, and this is a, a strategy divide to conquer. So not to have too, many, too much in one file or in one place, in one code. Right, function modules. Um, one code, one function, better overview, more structured. So it uh, goes back to um, splitting the code in a more um, readable and uh, atomic way where you can see like on one page what the function does, not spaghetti code, right function that do one thing. Yes, I think this is a, uh, Probably it's the best summary. One thing done well, don't try to do too many things in one function. Uh, so what, what else would you add uh, rather than, for instance, here? What does modular code development mean to you? Oh, yeah, right. I should add also my sentence there. And I will add it. But what it means for me is um, that it's I can copy paste it to another project and it will still work. So it should be a relatively small unit to do one thing. So things have been mentioned and also ideally pure copy paste ability. Yeah, so I think that's uh, what you mentioned is reusability from one project to another is uh, probably what we aim to achieve when you do modular code. That you you don't you you can reuse what has been done and you don't have to change too many lines because it's uh, already um, modular enough to be uh, uh, reused. So there is no hard coded. There are pure functions. Uh, I like the analogy to Lego. I think it's a good analogy. Uh, let's go to the next. It's going too quickly. I don't see the next question. <laughs> Uh, I think there are also many, there's a theme about naming and uh, scopes okay. of knowledge. I don't know. And you if you that? want to look at... Naming, um, where do you see naming? There's a lot of... Um, what best practice? It. Oh, this is for the best mm -hmm. practices. Yes. Yeah. So I was, thank you, because I was looking for uh, the next question. And uh, naming, this is very good point, actually. Um, and uh, in a big project, usually you have a naming convention. So to have understandable names, X is not very uh, understandable. My function is definitely not understandable. My function one, my function two is not understandable. Um, so have, having some kind of descriptive uh, for function and for variables too. Uh, have yeah, readability, yes. readability, understandability. Also, I see a theme of not only splitting the code, but also splitting environments. Yes. Like using separate environments for separate projects and documenting them. Yeah, actually, I was saying uh, we don't see too much about documentation, uh, but this is uh, really part of the uh, modular code development. Because if, if you increase the readability, it has to be uh, documented um, to be reusable. So it's really part of it. Make function as atomic, uh, T 
practice do you design a new code project or paper or, or on paper before coding? Yes, I do. Okay, so that's really good. No, I usually implement um, sometimes. Uh, I have to admit, I, I learn on the paper. I don't do it anymore. Now, for instance, I, I use a lot of, uh, for instance, Jupyter Notebook and things like that to prototype. Um, and uh, I define interfaces. So maybe this, I, I have more in-depth discussion about the interfaces, but um, I, I tend to jump in maybe a bit too quickly. And do you ever, like when you design code or design a project, because you could just design it perfectly and then implement it. But yeah, uh, never do it... that. I mean, I usually, uh, I don't know why, but it, it's uh, unrealistic to mm. try to, uh, to, to do everything from day one. Um, so it's really better. I think it's better to do like a, a step by step. You start little, so um, there is no need to have a, a very complex structure. It's an overkill. And you refactor your code as you, it evolves. And this is really important to refactor uh, very often. Is it how you do it, Rodeman? Yeah, also my experience is that when designing, we cannot anticipate everything. So at some exactly. point, it's good yeah. to start start writing it down, starting start coding, because then I realize that I missed certain things at the design stage. And then I go back to the to the paper and redesign. Like I never get it right the first time. Yes. I never get it right either. And uh, I think it's, uh, if you get it right, it's uh, either a super simple project. Or, uh, usually if I believe it is right, it's because I don't really see it is wrong. <laughs> and uh, I, will, uh, I will see it later. Yeah, there was this great quote. I don't know where, who wrote it. Um, like the Kennedy quote that we we do we started programming not because we thought uh, not because it's easy, but because we thought it was easy. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's uh, exactly what happens to me. Uh, so we have top down and bottom up. Uh, what the top down uh, means and bottom up approach uh, here. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's okay. Yeah, go on, Radovan. Oh, I think it seems that the question was not clear. What we yes. meant by that. I think what we meant is that do we start with implementing first the small things, the small functions, mm. the small Lego pieces, and then we put it together? Or do we start from the big picture and then concretize it uh, and fill out the blanks? I think this is how I understand the question. Yes, that's uh, what we mean. And uh, um, I think depending uh, on your role in the in the project, you will probably start at different uh, uh, part i mean if i have to if i'm a developer and i'm only focused on one particular thing i will not bother and i will have the bottom up approach if i'm the architect of the project i, I will do the top down approach because this is my role um, but i like to try out any anyway with the bottom up like implement small things i think i like this one would you prefer your code to be two times slower if it was easier to read? Uh, and this is like the compromise you need to uh, have when you write code between readability, portability, and efficiency, which is not that straightforward. Um, you can have a code that's super fast, but it runs on, a, on one particular architecture and uh, with one particular, I don't know, processor or whatever, and then in five years, it's, it's dead because they, they will change it. So you need to, to think about it when you, you choose. And a great question came in on HackerD, and I think I want to lift it mm -hmm. because it's for everybody. Um, so sometimes we don't have the luxury to start from zero, where we design and everything, we make everything beautiful and everything modular. But <laughs> often we start, I mean, we, we get a, a code is given to us. And it's and it's maybe not modular. So how do you start then? How should we approach that if we have a code that we already have fifty thousand lines of code? How can we do modular code development based on that? 
So mm -hmm. if this is like a very big, big, big project, uh, you will not be able to uh, like redesign the architecture from scratch, but you have a role when every time you add something new to the code uh, and you can refactor this part and make it more modular. Uh, so at least whatever you add, uh, should you should try to make it to improve the modularity. Is it what you do, Radovan? Yeah, so I often start by, so at some point I want to change something or add something. Uh, one of the first things I will do is to look for tests or add some tests as a safety guard so that I know that when I'm changing things, it's still working. So the first thing I will do is to add an end-to-end -end test. And then when implementing something new, I would then try to move that one thing out of it to make it independent, to make it pure. And it can be sometimes unreasonable to rewrite the whole project. I mean, we don't have infinite resources to spend the next two years rewriting everything, but it can be gradually. Um, and the, the original code is then very valuable because it can serve as a reference. So whenever coding something new, I can then compare to the to the mm -hmm. unmodular code. And over time, the hope is that over time, we end up with separate modules. And at some point we can maybe phase out the uh, the old code. Yeah, and uh, I mean, what I would add is a very big project. If uh, there is no um, like willingness of uh, all the partner of the project to refactor the code from time to time, it will be very hard. Uh, so you need to focus on, on your own development, unfortunately. I mean, what I mean is if refactoring needs an effort from everyone and it costs money because it costs software development and usually the scientific development will be staled for some time because it's very hard to have parallel development or you at least you need to think about it. And often when refactoring, and when we use the word refactoring, it means that changing, improving. So when yes. we change, improve code, it often means that we delete somebody else's code. Yeah. And there can be resistance against it, and it can feel wrong, and it can feel like writing the original deleted code was a waste. But that is not the case, uh, because the original code served as a basis and as a reference, and without the deleted code, the new code wouldn't be there. So we, we should also, I think, maybe feel better about deleting code and give credit for deleted code also. Yes, that's uh, absolutely true, actually. Uh, that's usually the first task, task of when you start as a developer, we ask you to delete some useless part. OK, so I think we have quite a lot of things here. Um, let's see if we can put some of this in application. Um, okay, so here uh, I probably can leave it. Uh, this one, this is what we will uh, we will experiment. Now we said, okay, modular code. This is what we ideally would like to do. Let's try it out. Uh, so we'll take an example. We have some data. If I open it, uh, so this is like a um, time series of temperature in degrees in some location. And the location, as you can see, this is quite negative, not quite low, uh, quite low values. It's uh, in, uh, in Helsinki airport, so it's quite cold. So this is why we have a negative temperature here. And this is the time here and uh, the year and months and day and the time in UTC. So what we will try, uh, is to analyze this data to make some plots and we'll try to grow the project as a modular code, getting your input on this. Uh, and we'll start with an initial code that uh, either you get from a colleague or uh, you start yourself trying to implement a few things from what you do. And uh, the idea here is uh, you start with something. So this is uh, not necessarily very modular how can we improve this code to be to become a bit more modular and reusable? Um, and we would like you to, uh, um, to tell us what we can do to make this code more modular. So please give us tips on HackMD. I'll be watching them and relaying them. Also, here we will work on a Python project. Yes. But, um, 
but the point here is not Python. So hopefully, uh, the, the really the main points that we will try to crystallize out are independent Design, of the language. Yeah. So hopefully, even even if you have never seen Python, hopefully it will make sense. Also, when you look at it through uh, our language lens or C++ lens. Uh, so maybe I can already uh, get the data and uh, run the code here. So I would have this. Uh, do I have the code somewhere? And maybe not in the right folder. I'm not sure where I am actually. We could clone it again. No, I'm not in the right. <laughs> I was doing the exercise before. Uh, yeah. So uh, at least on my monitor, I wonder whether it's uh, where the zoom cuts off the bottom of it. So if it can, if you can uh, move the bottom of it a little bit up, but maybe it's. Okay, sorry for this. Yeah, just like that. Is it better right now? I think maybe one more, I don't know, the unit centimeter. Yes. This? Yeah. Okay. So what uh, I would usually do is uh, I will try it out. Is it what you would do, Radovan? Yeah, exactly. Let's first try whether it works and then we, we, will, we will improve it. So I, I, I sometimes it's a quite long code, so I have no clue what it does. So I, I uh, Usually take, a, if I can, a notebook and I will try it out. And I will name uh, the notebook. Right on here, right here. Analysis. Uh, and I will execute to see what it does. Uh, I, apparently, so what does the code, uh, is it, the font is large enough for everyone to read? I think font is okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we do here is uh, we have a number of measurements here. This is fixed to 25 uh, and we open a data. So here we are using Panda, which is a package in, uh, in Python. And we are opening this uh, temperature.csv. So this is comma separated values, which is a file I, I showed you with the content of uh, some uh, temperature measurement from um, Helsinki airport. And we are reading only the 25th first measurement. Um, and we are extracting the temperature in degree, which is the last colon, computing the mean uh, value, and then making a plot. Well, it, here, this is obviously customized. And then we save the plot in a file. So here, when I execute, I should have a file. Yeah, and this is what I get. So it seems to work. This is good already. Mm -hmm. uh, so now I would like you to suggest what would be the next steps for us. And we're uh, already getting a couple of suggestions in. So one, okay. one suggestion was in, um, in the code, this? there is a hard-coded 25. So what if I want to have more measurements or less measurements? It could be when saving the, uh, when saving the plot, that should be this 25 point PNG at the end. Mm -hmm. So we should generalize that okay. to any number of measurements. The other suggestion was that to split it into functions. And this is a simple, simple example where we do some readings, some statistics and some plotting, but later we may want to actually reuse this in a different project. So it would be nice to have maybe a, a read function, a compute mean function and a plot function. Yes, and the reason is usually um, like reading, you may want to implement uh, like a reader for different types of files or different format, but you still want maybe to use the same uh, like computation for all of them if they are, have the same structure. And plotting, you will probably want to plot many times to check and change and customize the plot. So it's, it's good if this is separated and you can make different plots with different colors or different output formats. So it's a good way to modularize. So, um, so we had the suggestion to change this uh, to, to have a more uh, custom, I mean, parameterized uh, 
uh, file name, if I understood properly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, we can do the simple way. So when I, I, I write code, I still think about who will be reusing the code and extending the code. So don't make it necessarily very complicated. What would you do here? Something simple like this? I would change uh, this. Would work or not? Yeah, which, like that. which is what I uh, have been asked. I would have, uh, and then I re-execute. It says four minutes, so it hasn't re refreshed. Maybe it doesn't work. Okay, yes, seconds. So I have this. Okay. It's a bit more modular. Uh, what are the other suggestions? I don't know if I... Oops. To split into functions. Okay, that's a very good suggestion. So we would uh, do like what, three function? Yes, and what we can... Actually, I don't know whether we will follow really the goal because the goal was also that we would, instead of, instead of plotting only one plot with 25, we want to create plot with 25, 100, and 500. Yeah, but once we have function, maybe we, I mean, here we have this parameter. Yep. So we can plot uh, as many as we want, no? Yeah, so I think it's never a mistake to put, put this into functions. So we could create three functions. Okay, so let's create three functions. So question I have here, Radovan, would you still continue to work on this um, notebook? When do you switch from the notebook and not notebook? Because we had many times this discussion when, uh, when we presented to Jupiter. Yeah. Um, I think I would already, I would already go into a terminal and work there. But this is just because I'm more used to moving things around in a Python script. We can still go for a while here in the notebook. At some point, if we have time, we will end up adding a command line interface, maybe, if somebody suggests it. And then as soon as I want to have a command line interface, then I'm already outside of the notebook. Yes, how about, and how for about instance, you? Uh, I would probably maybe still prototype the function here, but probably not, because as soon as I, I start to have a function, I want to have tests. Mm -hmm. And this is much easier to have it in a script. Yes. But we could prototype and then uh, um, start moving after the prototype. Yes, we can do that. OK, so let's uh, add, uh, I would add a cell here. So you would add a, a function to read. Yeah, so let's call it read data. And what should it receive? It, it should receive two things, the file name, or it can be a URL. Um, and the other thing would be the number of measurements. Okay. And later, if we want to generalize it even more, we could even provide which column, because here we look at the air, air temperature, but later maybe we want to pick up some other yeah. column. Because we here we have yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's do that. So what we would do is we remove this part, no? From the code here. Yes, exactly. Now let's move it up. And I move it here. Yeah, and in Python we need to indent. Yeah. And then the function needs to return something. Yeah. So what is it that it returns? It returns the temperatures. So here we have created a function. Is it a pure function? It's not really a pure function because we don't know what happens inside the file name. So if we use if we call it with the same file name, it may not give the same thing because the file name itself can I mean the file itself can change. But it's already a good starting point. Yeah. Can we have pure function when we have input outputs? No. Yeah. Because so, yeah. file files, databases, web web internet changes, so they they are inherently impure. So somewhere we need to do input outputs. 
yeah, exactly. So, but we have to isolate them as much as possible. So this is why also another reason to have uh, one function read where we isolate this uh, interaction with the outside world. Yes, and now we need to call that function down there that we should not forget. So now we want to have the temperatures. Temperatures equals read data. And here, what do I do? Because uh, I'm not sure I have fully, it's not fully right what I have done here. Yeah, it's yet. not fully right because if we, if we would not change that, we could call it with any file name, it would still always read the temperatures to CSV. So it was a good change. Yes, that looks very good. And then a similar, a similar change we would do for the, for the computing. Compute. So let's and, do the function. And it's a very simple example here, but we can imagine that this is really more involved statistics. Yeah. So let's make another function, uh, compute statistics. Uh, and here, the uh, same, it takes as an input. Um, if we stick to the code, we, we would have uh, two values, like uh, yes. data and uh, uh, num data. Yeah, Oops. should we already improve it or should we improve it later? Because the data in Python, at least we, it knows how many of how many exactly. elements it has. Yeah. So we could just receive data. Should we do it immediately or later? Yeah. So we could do it like that. And then inside we do, we return sum of the data divided by length of the data. I mean, we can do it uh, if, yeah. So we could do a mean directly, but. Uh, yeah. So we could also use a library to compute the mean. You can do this, no? If it is. Uh, but this is, uh, it, it may pandas. not be fully general. Yeah, so because then we would assume that we have pandas data frame. It's, it works with many. Uh, and now divided by len, len of temperatures. And thanks so much for the suggestions of HackMD. I'm watching them and we will. They are not forgotten. So we will yeah, try it's just to I'm a bit them. slow. <laughs> uh, so here we do this and we compute. Statistics and data in this case is temperatures. Okay. And then we have the latest one. Plot results. And here again, we need temperature. Temperatures and mean. Uh, yes. Oh, and what else? And value or a number of measurements. Uh, actually, maybe we don't. We don't need to. No, the number of measurements we can actually deduce from the temperatures. Uh, and then let's plot. So I copy pass mostly again. Yeah. Uh, we move this from here and I hide it. And this, what Anne is doing has actually a couple of advantages. One is that, well, we create functions that we can reuse in other projects or other notebooks, that's great. But the other nice advantage is that we, we put code into our box. And now when I read only the code on this last cell, I can, I can already understand what is going on even with, if I don't really know Python, because I can see that while we read, we read data, and then we compute statistics and then we plot something. And then if I want to know the details, I can look inside the functions. But if I'm not interested in the details, I don't have to open them up. Yes, and another advantage is uh, I, I can now change everything I want in this function uh, without changing the main here. So it means uh, the structure remains the same and I can refactor the code. It's uh, much easier. Did I forget something? Probably yes. I mean, well, let's try it out. It looks pretty, yeah. pretty nice. So here, a uh, good practice, we would probably want to restart the kernel and start from scratch. You know? And uh, maybe I would put this at the top. Yeah. Uh, have another sale, actually. So at, at least we run, I mean, all the cells from top to bottom. Yeah, but it, because we have already some variable have been defined, I would uh, probably uh, start from scratch. Uh, uh, restart kernel and run. Okay, it did something. 
Should we try to put the plot into the notebook so that it shows up? Yes. In fact, I don't really remember how, but plot show or something. Yes. Uh, or if we maybe if we remove. No, wait a moment. I like, think we, we, want to do we can do plots. that. But we can do it for testing. Yeah. It should. Uh, I think we did it. Oh, sorry. And it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Then there was a suggestion to add title and axis annotation. Mm -hmm. I yeah. admit that I don't remember how, but we have it in the. So then we could. So we want that. to have a, what a title, PLT title for the title. Mm -hmm. I guess. Let me check how um, that works. And what is the title? So here are. Uh, yes. In Helsinki, um, and then uh, to have and yes, this is probably not uh, very customable <laughs> yeah. because I put the temperature here, um, so it's probably not very. Uh... So yeah, I would do a very often like that for um, for plotting. Oh, I why did I put it back? This okay. So I have a, a title. Um, maybe we want the title to be a parameter. I don't know what are the suggestions. Uh, and then the other one was what to get. Uh, uh, is it X label? Oh, uh, that was so uh, X label. Yes. Uh, this is temperature. Uh, and I see also the comment on Zoom chat. Very good comment. Actually, we made a mistake, which is really interesting. <laughs> yes, this is excellent. That's a, that's a, a fantastic. We made a very good yes. mistake. And we can, but let's first fix uh, the labels. What is X is time? We don't even know what, to, it's not really time. Here. Um, number of measurements. Oh. I don't remember, I think it was days or. So. Yes, so we, we did a really big bug, which uh, is a usual, I would do that all the time. And to, to demonstrate the bug, uh, there is a bug in the computer statistics function. But it didn't plot, it didn't spot it when. Yeah, and to reveal it, I think we could move up the computer statistics cell in front of the read data cell and then rerun all cells. Will that reveal it or not? I'm curious, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. So what if we, we reorder the cells? So the cell three before the cell two. Let's, if I do, oops, sorry, if I do this, we should see. I, I restart the kernel and clear, clear the output. Uh, and the statistics, I don't know why it uh, returns something. Oh, this is a function, yes. And now, uh -huh, yeah, so it will not reveal it, correct. So the, let's talk about the mistake. So the mistake is that we were, in the compute statistics, we a function, if you scroll up, we receive data as an argument, but we don't use it. And this would stop working as soon as I take the compute statistics function and I put it into my other notebook where temperatures is not defined. This would, this would not work anymore. No, it, it will always work because it's defined here as a global variable. Yeah, but in the um, in my other notebook, maybe I don't have any temperatures, but I still want to compute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, mean. yeah, yeah. I mean, the, this is typically here. This is not a pure function. Yeah, it's not. So what let's fix the bug. Yeah, thanks. OK, uh, what were the other suggestion? I don't know if I can. So I'm looking whether we forgot anything. So some of them, I think we need more time to think about. I don't know. But one, one goal that we had in the exercise was mm -hmm. to not only plot 25, but we want to have more plots, three plots. Oh, yeah. So at least now I can do, a, I could try another value instead of 25, because 25 is taking the 25 first values. 
of this yes. uh, yeah, let's try. Let's time try series, it. but it's much longer actually. We have lots of data. We have yes. more than 700. So let's try um, some other number. It's also a good test before going on whether this still is working. Yes. Okay, I have something. Seems to. Seems and to I, I work. should check probably if I have a, a file. Does it update the file? Yes, I have a new file created. And it looks, there is no X label, uh, Y label. I probably, you see, I made another bug, uh, probably somewhere. I, I call it X here. Oh, yeah. Uh, this temperature is Y. Mm -hmm. This is another one. Uh, so here's the advantage of using the Jupyter notebook. If I'm going back and forth, and then I'm fixing my uh, my bug, which because I, I mean, if I write one uh, one line of code, I usually have ten different bugs. So it's a really quick way to prototype. But at some point, we'll have to make proper tests. So now, uh, what should we do? You said you want to make several plots with different values. Interesting because we'll see some problems. Yes, so in the, um, so now the goal changed a bit. So we showed the plot to our colleague supervisor and it looks great, but now we want to have several plots. We want to have a plot for 25, 100 and 500. Okay, so what should I do? Probably uh, make a loop somewhere. Yeah, we can solve it with a loop. So let's make or, a loop here. Actually iteration, so we will iterate over three different values. Okay, so for, uh, I don't know, them, uh, in uh, range of, or in uh, maybe we put uh, the measurement, what do you want to do? Uh, so I think I would do four num measurements. I would keep the name same because then I don't need to change anything below. So for, no, sorry, what I meant is four num measurement in Oh, yes, you want to, yeah. to change your yeah. For the measurements in measurement. And then in a list of, of 25, 100, 500. Okay, 500. Uh, yes, we have five more than this. OK, so I should remove this. Uh, and then I still read. It's maybe not optimal, but I read all the time. I compute the statistic for each and I plot. Let's see what, what it does, no? So should I make sure? Yeah, that's... Ooh. Everything got into the one plot or whatever? And there is only one plot, which is normal. This is Jupiter. But I should have three. Uh, which one is it? 25, 100 and 500. So this looks good to me. Then we have uh, the 50. Oh, no, was it? No, uh, 100. Oh, this is not already, it's not good. Why do I have two bars? Mm. Uh, and 500, this is even worse. Why do I have three bars? So there is a bug. Yeah. Yes, we should uh, uncommon. So now we understand why we had this PLT. So typically, for instance, when you don't know a function, at least this is what I do. When I don't know something, I usually remove and comment. And then I, at some point, I, I understand why the person uh, added it in, in the first place. So this, this is to clear when you plot. So uh, when, when you plot, you save to a file, and then you clean. And this is because we are here, we are using uh, PLT, which is from uh, Matplotlib, uh, the PyPlot. So it's like a global um, plotting routines. So here, if we clean every time, it, it will uh, start from a fresh um, figure and will not have these three lines. Let's try it out. And we'll always have the latest one only. Yeah, no, it doesn't show it, but I think now it generated them correctly if we yeah. look into the folder. And it doesn't show it because we clean here, but we have now 
let's wait. Yeah, 25, it's still okay. Uh, 100, it's better, sorry. And the 500, no, it's good too. Okay, so it looks better. So there is, how about, should we take a, like a short break and then continue? Um, yes, it's five minutes. Maybe, maybe that would be good, like until 55, how about that? Yeah. When we restart, there are a couple of questions that I want to then also bring up, but mm -hmm. I think it will be good for everybody to take a short break. Yes. So until 55. It's, do you write it down in the... Yes. It's a bit maybe... Da, da, da. Okay. okay. Yes, think about more suggestions. And when you think about suggestion, maybe think about what we have done during the two weeks and how we could improve based on what we have learned. So I will also be away for a minute, but the, there is a great question that I will then bring up once we are again on stream uh, about type one. Uh, so the question about a Panda data frame, mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit below. Below, okay. Yeah, no, yeah, there are this like big text. Uh, oh, this data. one. And I want to talk about type annotations there because yes. that's really good for a reader of a function. So we will talk about it. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think the break is over. If I have my time correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Diana. Okay, so shall we first uh, discuss this uh, very good question? Yes, this is, this is good. And it's also related to another one, which is further below, which is uh, for better readability, mm. that one. So and the question was, um, yeah, sorry, didn't want to interrupt. So the question was that at some point we talked about that we could assume or not that this is a data frame or not. It was in the... I see the it, statistics when we started to compute statistics. Yeah, because if we assume that this was a data frame, we could we could use the dot mean. But if, if we assume that this is a list, so how do we actually tell the reader and how do we tell Python uh, what kind of type it is? And this can be done with these type annotations. For instance, in the read, read data, we could add file name. We actually expect a string, so it will be a column SDR. Yes. And this, this helps the reader to not having to look into the function to already know what is expected here. A number of measurements is an int. So yes, this is good practice because uh, Python will uh, allow anything otherwise. Yeah. Should, not, should we test maybe then? Uh, Yes, int, and then it returns a float. So at the end of the, like before the, so now on the first line of the function. Oh yeah, you want to put uh, here? I don't, I never do that here. Yeah, so, so at the at the end of the, I, I wish we could do like collaborative notebook, but the, um, at the end Actually, of the Actually you can like, I could share the address with you. <laughs> ah, so <laughs> after, when the parenthesis closes, uh, at, then after the closing parenthesis, there will is be something um, like this. There like is, um, I don't remember this. Arrow. Like an error, arrow float. Uh, so minus minus arrow like this. Yes, and float. So this thing returns a float. Yeah. And if we do it, it this it helps the reader. We could do the same thing with the data. Actually, I don't know how. I mean, then I would have to look up what is the type of a data frame, but it the Python will still accept anything at this moment, but we can check for it. So there is this package, MyPy, that can automatically verify that the types are matching up. Mm. So one can also test that. And what so else should we I... try? So then we try again? Yeah, let's, let's try. And we could rerun it here. We don't have many. 
and we should check we have something. And so here, usually I would start to implement some tests because uh, I usually uh, will forget to check the output. Yeah, and that's a great suggestion. How would you do, would you add the test now in the notebook or would you start moving out of the notebook? I will start move out from the notebook. Yeah. And how, let's show, how do you move something that started as a notebook? How do you move it over to a script and to a, like a Python project? How do you do that? Oh yeah, I will uh, use uh, ND convert. Uh, how do you do that normally? So I, I don't have a good answer. I think I usually go here in the terminal, um, mm -hmm. and I have my notebook. Oops, uh, I don't know if is this readable. The, maybe I could make it a bit. But then, it's, if this is too big, we don't see much. Uh, and then I will do this Jupyter. Um, and we convert, I don't remember the syntax, but I think this is something like this. Python, to say I want to save it in Python, uh, and analysis. And I'm hoping it will create a, a dot .py from here. Mm -hmm. At least this is usually what I do. So I, I, that's why I, I don't do it when I have too many cells and I have done too many things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I should have somewhere. Okay, it appears somewhere, but I don't see it. Yeah, it's here. And then I have it here. Oh, yeah. uh, and then I, I would test it from the command line then. Yeah, that's I think great plan. So let's add a test. So yeah, I first test it like this. PY, just to make sure it's, and then we can add some tests now, no? Yes, let's add a test. So here we add a PY test. Um, so where do, oh, I'm, I'm not in the right one actually. <laughs> this is where I need to close it because otherwise. Oh yeah, because we are still in the cells. Yeah, and now I'm I'm moving out from the notebook and I'm writing in the uh, in the Python code. So we could add a test for the statistics function, for instance, as a okay. starting point. So where would you add the test? So here, do we add the test in the same file? Do we add uh, the test in another file? Yeah, that's uh, also a question that came up in the breakout room. So yeah. I often start by putting it into the same file close to the function because then yes. I use it as a documentation also. But but many projects prefer them to collect all the tests in a separate folder. But one can, I often start like this, and then I split it, split it up later when it gets too much. Yeah, that's uh, usually what I do uh, too. So let's maybe do that. So we do a def uh, test compute statistics. Um, and what should we test? So in there, there will be parentheses open close and inside we... Yeah, but what, uh, so we need to space, to pass, to define. Yeah, so some... let's define some example data, which would be for simplicity, let's do, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five. I mean, a list of a couple of numbers. So yeah, uh, the advantage is we can use anything. It's not typed. So we can use a list or whatever. Yes. Yeah, I could use. Uh, so, what do you want to test? test? Supposed to do the mean. <laughs> oh, how about yeah? Let's test. Let's test. One, uh, one is. Uh, so, how do you choose the values to choose? I mean, we'll uh, we'll make the average. Mm -hmm. um, how long should be the input? I think I would start with a couple of numbers. So in four or five numbers and I think I would have started with one, two, three, four. We can even, to make it more difficult, we could start with floats or should we start with integers? Let's start with floats because then it connects a bit to, to like this. Float like this or some yeah. more complicated floats? <laughs> so now these are numbers with, with a zero. So 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. And what is the what is the mean of that? 
So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. 10 divided by 4, 2.5. So we expect 2.5. Yeah. So now we, co we call the compute statistics function in the next line. So I don't know, result equals. Yeah, we can put uh, the results equals uh, compute. Statistics and data. And now we want to verify. So we assert. And result. we check uh, results equals to. Uh, equals equals 2.5. And even better would be actually to do this pytest dot approx 2.5, because then we test with there was this one optional exercise where you can verify there could be like it could be 2.5 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then one. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's uh, here. It's yeah. It. So then we add pytest. Yeah. Uh, I think it's approx like this. It's approx, but then on top you need to then import approx. Or or here you say pytest.approx. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, maybe pytest.approx yeah. yeah. So I think this will work, but let's have a look. Let's try it out. Yeah. And so here, by the way, I, I hope everyone is convinced that uh, pair programming is very useful. Uh, so here, I test the first, and then I it still works, this one, and I do PyTest. This PyTest will now only run the test function, nothing else. I hope so. It will test all the tests, but I have only one. I think I could, I could pass it otherwise. Why is it so much now? Oh, can you do PyTest temperature analysis? Somehow I didn't find it. Yeah, I'm not sure where. Okay, okay. now it found something. I, I needed to pass it, okay. It ran. The Good. next thing, I, so that's, that's great. We also got a suggestion of making sure that, at some point we saw that the data has 720 something mm -hmm. entries. So what if we, how do we make sure that we cannot, so how would we go about that? Because the data is limited, but here the here we can ask, what if I ask for 1,000? Yeah, Panda will not fail, actually. That's, uh, but uh, if you... Uh, ah, okay, so it, it will not fail, that's why. So that also answers the question, why did it still work? So it will only take the ones that it finds? Yeah, it's a feature of Panda. It's not very good, actually. <laughs> okay. All right. What else should we do now with the code? Uh, um, do we have other suggestions? So we have, I also see that we have kind of like 10 minutes left because then we should mm -hmm. yeah. wrap up the workshop. I wonder whether we have time to do, I'm looking at the questions, some of them we have implemented. Yeah, do we still have left, some left? I'm not sure I have a look at all the questions. So the thing that I would do, I don't know whether we have time, but I can at least mention it, that if we look at that script and if you scroll down, we have this iteration here, four num a measurement in 25, 100, 500. What I would do if, as a next step in this project, and we may not have time to implement it, but would be to create a command line interface so that I can, that I can set the number of measurements from outside when calling the script so that I don't have to set it inside because that will give me a lot of flexibility. I can decide on the fly and I can then use workflows. And in a workflow, I can then iterate over 50 different values. So that will be the next step that I would do to the code. Yeah, that's usually something I do quite early actually, because as soon as you have this as a as the script, Mm -hmm. um, it's very cumbersome to test every time. So here you, are, you have to go and edit the file for different measurement. Yes. Uh, and ideally, if I, I could do this in parallel, so I could use SnakeMake, for instance, and do all the plots uh, in parallel with the workflow, as you mentioned. So I would definitely. Yeah. So let's try it. So let's that's something that we could do. We also have, I also want to remind that in the HackMD, I put a link to like a solution page where we show one possible solution. I mean, there are infinitely many solutions, but we show one. The other suggestion that we may or may not have time to do is to move some of the functions that we have defined to separate modules. Because we yeah. could imagine that 
Uh, well, how about collecting all the plot functions in a module? How about collecting all the statistics functions in a module so that we can import them in other notebooks and in other projects? So we could try that too. I don't know what you think. We have so like yeah. seven minutes left. Um, I think maybe this command line is, is good to show because it's uh, something fairly easy to implement and it really makes uh, much more uh, modular your code. I mean, the other, what you mentioned is mostly moving to yeah. different files. No, what yes, do you think? I agree. And we have examples for both of these suggestions in, in the, um, on the page. So let's try the, let's try the command line interface. Okay, so the command line interface, uh, there are many different ways to, uh, to add the command lines. I'm not sure which one is the simplest. I think the one you have implemented with click is very simple. Yeah, so there are a couple of, there are arc bars, op bars. Yeah, there is, usually are, are I don't know, there's a handful. The example that we have shown on this solution is using click library. I think so it's, it's, library that, it's a very yeah. simple library. Yeah, Shall we like try? It. Okay, so we, what would be the next step when you do that is uh, usually you, you have to make a new function, which is the main function. Right, right. Uh, and here, instead of uh, going through the different measurement, we'll, uh, we'll go only through one, because the idea is uh, we could do it outside the Python, this main program. So let's try to do that. I replace this by def main, and this already would be uh, very similar, but I need at least to pass some arguments, which is at least a num this number of uh, measurement. Which could be the first one. Um, anything else we want to uh, parameterize for the main? What else do we want to be able to pass? Um, no, it would be also good to to pass uh, input file nice. and output file. So instead of having it here written, it would be nice if I can decide from outside whether this is called temperatures.csv or data.csv. So input, and I think in the solution we call it in file, but yeah, input file, good. And, and also output file. So what is the name of the- But the output file we never, uh use because we always use a name. Yeah, but I would- So, so you I would, would change actually, it. I would change it. So it would okay. be input file, output file, number of measurements. And then I would, we need to send in the, we need to pass the M output file down to plot results because that is using it. So plot results now gets one more argument, which is the output file. We will also see that things will get a bit simpler in the code. Uh, so because, here we can add it directly. Yeah. And then you need to change the save fig. It will, instead of all of that, all we say is output file. Output file. And now the user can decide. So it's not the code deciding, yeah. it's the user decides. So now we have these uh, three arguments and we need to add, uh, um, to parameterize, so to tell, um, the user can specify what is the input file, the output file, and the measurement. So we'll use this uh, click, which we need to import. And I probably don't put it in the right order here with flake, but uh, let's do it this way. Uh, and here I would need to add, uh, um, and I don't fully remember the syntax, but it's something like this. Yeah. And so I, first is click dot command. Yeah. This is to set up the yeah. command and then for each option. No, you yeah, for each set. option there is a new one. So there will be a click dot option. And, and first we say is, how it's called. So in the quotes, uh, dash dash. We, we would copy this or? Yeah, dash dash, also minus minus input file. And maybe I wonder, yeah, this will work like this. Yeah, input file is good. We say yeah. that it's required. So comma required equals true. So here, this is mandatory to, to, to specify the input file, which is true. Yeah, because we always need it, otherwise yeah. the code won't work. And then- We should put the type maybe somewhere or no, or well, maybe not. Is, is it default is a string maybe? I think so, yeah. Okay, and so it should be text. enough. Oh, uh, be help, 
Yes. Or we can leave it out. So we could say. No, but it's uh, good. Good practice. Let's put a help text. Um, so this is the input file name. Yeah. Name to read. Plot. Yes, and now you can copy that, and we want the same for the output file. Output. And then we want the third one option, which is the number of measurements. Output. This is actually the output file uh, image. Yeah. And then the third uh, option. Then we need another one, yeah. Which is the number of measurements. Also required. In this case, it's type equals int. Okay, so sorry, I put a number. Not to plot. And uh, type yes. equals int. And this is because the default will always be a string when you have arguments, and uh, we want to convert it directly into an integer. Yeah. And now let's, did you save? Let's try it out. So here, what happens if I uh, I do it you know, like, no, like this is, should give me uh, nothing. And that's why we, because we never call the main function. Hmm. Ah, that's good point. <laughs> that's, uh, that's something we forget. So here we have created a new uh, main. Uh, which means we we need to call the main here, and uh, the way we call the main is uh, um, this main like this. Yeah. But normally we, I don't know, maybe we can do that. This will work. Or oh, there is this more Python way of doing it, but yeah, maybe, maybe we start with this. Yeah. So now it should complain that it expects something that we don't give. That's great. And also it tell, it gives me a help text. So let's try also the help text. Temperature analysis dot py dash dash help. And that's, and the wonderful. Help, yeah, that's right? really great because this is exactly what we have specified actually. Like why uh, it is important to have a help. Otherwise we would not have anything. Yeah, so let's try that out and then we will conclude. So yeah. now we can choose input file was temperature CSV, output file, you can decide. And number of measurements, we can also decide. And this is great because now the so user doesn't have to understand Python to and change it. I don't it. need any quote actually. And we can make, let the workflow do this for us. We can parallelize over it. Yes, and here, if I check, I should have a new file called temp, because this is what I have asked. And I have my um, plot. That's great. Yeah, and I fantastic. think we should stop uh, maybe here. I mean, yeah, there are many us. things to improve again, uh, and a lot more. We can put it in Git. We can do a lot more. Um, at least. It's very useful, as you can see, to uh, to be two person to code and develop. I think like pair programming is not a model that is very often used. I think it's very useful. So think about it when you have junior people in your team. Uh, what else, Radovan, can we say for concluding? Yeah, I want to also say thanks so much for the all the suggestions and questions. Yes. I didn't manage to keep to up keep with up. everything, but we will we will comment on those that didn't get answered. Um, so we will follow up on this. Also, I put a link to one possible solution. And hopefully this was useful also for those. So hopefully it was not too much about Python. It was more about how do we move things out? How do we work iteratively? How do we approach it? Yes. And I mean, there are many very good suggestions. It's far to be like a production code. Uh, it's mostly to show a bit like the process. And that's it. Thank you, everyone.